Uh, so yeah, you did get through the first maybe couple, two or three slides. Did you, did I talk about the statistics? Do you remember that? Um, we were getting here. Okay. Here, I'll just yeah. briefly review this. The point here I want to make is that when we look at how we use CT or how we image children, 84% uh, of the dose we give to the pediatric population comes from CT. Majority of imaging is still in the head and then the other and 25% in the body. So 75% of imaging for CT is head and abdomen, pelvis. And then the majority of the dose is broken down by abdomen, pelvis, and then head. And that 15% of the imaging that we do for pediatrics is done in pediatric centers. So I'm a Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I'm a standalone hospital. Uh, still, the majority of children are imaged in adult-centric hospitals. In this publication down here, about a decade ago, they, they found that still 90% of all ER, uh, ER exams for children were performed at adult hospitals. And then the next thing I wanted to share with you is a paper, a, a work that myself, Keith Strauss, and Dr. Samasandaram and the ACR did back in 2019. We looked at about 240,000 exams, uh, or patient exams across the nation, and we broke it down as a function of patient physical size and where they were imaged. So the dark purple or dark blue is academic pediatric, light purple is non-academic pediatric, the red is academic adult, and the orange is non-academic adult. And just using this yellow box right here as an example, uh, we, looking at this patient population of 14 and a half to 18 centimeter effective diameter, which roughly breaks down to about 12 to 23 kilos or seven to 13 years in age, that the at the academic pediatric center, the median dose was 3.6 milligram. And that was 57% lower than the non-academic adult hospital of 8.3 milligram. So taking this slide and putting the previous slide together, you see that where we still are, the majority of imaging is performed in adult centers, that their doses still tend to be, you know, roughly 50, 60% higher than academic and non-academic pediatric hospitals. So we do have ways to go to continue to improve imaging for pediatric pediatrics in all centers, not just pediatric hospitals, but all centers. Uh, so I'm actually the vice chair of Image Gently. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is just kind of our, our experience from Image Gently and how we can communicate kind of intelligently how to image gently or to image with the right dose to get the right successful outcome. And so that is our goal using just, just the right amount. And so oftentimes when people talk about optimizing pediatrics, they immediately think we just need to turn the dose down. And that is not always the case. And I have a lot of examples throughout my talk. So I hope to make that point evident as we go throughout this lecture. There we go. So the first lesson I'd like to, to share with you is one, when you're optimizing for image quality and dose, you need to understand what the radiologist needs in that image. So if they come to you and say, I can't see you know, X, Y, and Z, your first response, it shouldn't always necessarily be just increased dose. But the reality is you need to ask, well, what is it that they can't see and why is it they can't see it? And as you get to know and you become kind of the integral partner with your radiologist, you may realize, as an example, it might be a limiting spatial resolution issue, in which case to resolve the problem, it might be as simple as reducing the focal spot, reducing the parameters so that you use a smaller focal spot size, changing the reconstruction kernel, or even changing the reconstruction algorithm in total. So once again, it's not simply just changing dose that solves every problem. And I give an example of if you change this, if, if you want better resolution, so we're going to try to image with a smaller focal spot, you actually want to keep your MA lower. So turning up the dose is counterproductive in this case. So if we lower our MA, we may also need to lower our pitch. We also may need to slow our rotation time down, and we may need to at times image with a little bit higher KV. And so the nuance of what is causing the problem is something that we need to spend our time understanding. The second is know your CT technology. Uh, I echo the sentiments that have been shared previously with, as a medical physicist, I think one of the most important things I did in my early stages of my career was I sat down with all the technologies of each modality. And I learned how to use every machine. I, used, learned, I learned how what every button does. And if you don't understand the technology, it's really hard to optimize it. So you may ask the question, well, what factors affect dose the most, especially in pediatrics? Well, it's 
size. And when it comes down to it, the you know, when you're trying to image one patient that plays football and then the next time you the next patient that walks through the or rolls through the door is going to be less than one years old, the system has to be efficient enough to bounce between these. So ultimately you're going to have to set up multiple protocols based on different sizes. Now, uh, in a perfect world, you would set up all your protocols as a based on size or attenuation and not all machines or not all vendors give that option. Weight is a good option. Uh, age is appropriate, especially when you're imaging in the head. I do not recommend age in the body. And I'll give you an example from the Kleinman publication in 2010. They went through and made a bunch of measurements of the anterior, posterior, lateral, all those different measurements of the body. And they found when you look at the scatter plot that a the smallest 17 year old was basically the same size as one of the largest three year olds. And so that's why we don't necessarily set up our a, our abdomen, or our, I, I should say our body protocols based on age. So when considering factors relating to dose and image quality, what is the hierarchy of things that we need to consider? The first and foremost, in my, my, my humble opinion, is you need to understand the imaging task. Don't be afraid to have multiple different protocols based on imaging task, because the settings for noise, spatial resolution, and image contrast will change and may be very dependent upon what you're looking for. And I have examples of that as we go throughout today's lecture. Patient compliance. Obviously, pediatrics, that makes sense, right? Uh, we need to make sure that we have the right strategies in place to keep our kids calm and you know, sedate, either calm or using sedation to keep the kids safe, uh, excuse me, uh, stationary so that we can image and do it without motion artifacts. And then of course, there's the technology. So I kind of put that at the bottom of the list. It's, it's absolutely important. I'm not saying it's the least important, but I'm just saying when, it's, when I sit down and I work through my hierarchy of, of, optimiz of my optimization scheme, this is how I look at it. And then you can kind of break down all the various different buttons and parameters you can adjust on your CT scanner. The ones I've highlighted here in red, scan mode being it for either helical or axial, the, th the big three KVMA rotation time, the various different settings that you set up for your tube current modulation, pitch and detector coverage. These most directly affect the output or dose. Now there are other factors that will also affect image quality and dose to a, lo a smaller effect, such a uh, smaller yeah, factor, such as slice thickness, the, the display, field of view and reconstruction algorithm. The point in this slide I want to make here is dose is not the only parameter that affects image quality. This box here in red, those are usually the first things we go to try to change when someone complains. The reality is there's a lot more that we can do. So let me give you some specific considerations when we talk about imaging for pediatrics, when we optimize between dose and image quality. The first being body habitus. I mentioned patient size is very important, but I want to give you an example of where patient attenuation is actually a much more important factor to consider. Both of these patients are 16 year old male. They both have a lateral measurement of 28 centimeters. But in this case, the patient on the right has a much greater muscularity, has more muscle in their, uh, in their, on their frame. And so the muscle, as we know, really absorbs photons. And so we needed more MA. And so same size, uh, I don't know the weight, but same basic demographic, the ultimate, ultimately the system needed more output. And so when you set up your tube current modulation, you need to make sure you factor in not only the weight and size, but the fact that you may have different attenuation profiles. Obviously, as we mentioned, smaller bodies are, uh, the pediatric patients come in all shapes and sizes, especially in smaller bodies. And when you do that, we have to consider, for example, the vasculature. So when we go to image, say a one-year-old, we're going to have limitations on IV contrast administration, both volume and rate. And this is going to diminish the, the way the vasculature appears in the image. And it may also, if you're doing cardiac image, ultimately diminish the, or limit the vo total volume you can use to image. So these are considerations to, that you have to account for. But also when you use, have a smaller patient, you're going to use a smaller field of view. And smaller field of view means you have smaller pixel size, which is good for resolution, right? But it also changes the perceived noise. Now we have the same problem in, in fluoroscopy and that's why we bin our pixels. And so when you change the binning, you change the resolution, yes, but you also keep the noise relatively the same. 
In this case, we don't actually bin our pixels. We don't want to do that. We lose resolution. And so when we go from a small field of view to a large field of view, the perceived noise will change in CT. So you have to account for that with uh, various different settings, which I'll talk about. And then fat, you know, little kids, they just don't come with a lot of visceral fat. And even obese kids don't have a lot of visceral fat. They may have a lot of subcutaneous fat, but that visceral fat goes a long way to provide inherent tissue contrast. And fat actually is a really good shield for radiation. It absorbs that extra radiation. And then another consideration is cooperation. As I mentioned, we need to find a way to make sure the kids are cooperative. They, they're laying still, we can perform the exam. And everyone immediately talks about toddlers and they think about kids that won't sit still, they're crying. But I mean, any one of you that have ever had teenagers know that teenagers can be as uncooperative as a teenage, uh, a baby. So we have to have the, the tools in place to help both populations. So I mentioned to you up at the very beginning that basically 75 to 80% of all CT imaging is done in the head and the abdomen and pelvis. So if you only have a short amount of time to make two changes on your CT scanner, the two changes I highly recommend are optimizing your head scan, your head protocols and your body or your abdomen pelvis protocols. Because in that way, you are affecting 70 to 80% of the actual dose to your pediatric population at your hospital. I'm not saying chest imaging, but is, we should ignore it or MSK. But it, for people in our day and age, especially in hospitals, especially adult hospitals that maybe don't have full-time physics staff, let's focus on what we can do to make the biggest change. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you some examples on how to optimize head imaging for pediatrics. I'm going to go through each one of these bullet points individually on the following slides. So the first thing you can do and the best way to reduce dose to pediatrics is not image them when you don't need to. Uh, in the Image Gently, we had our Think Ahead campaign. And in this case, we emphasized using something called the PCARN or the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network criteria. And so what they did, they established basically an appropriateness criteria for when to image CT, use CT to image for traumatic brain injury. And they demonstrated that patients without any PCARN risk factors rarely, if ever, need a CT scan. And then those that even have maybe one or two low risk factors, observation is more than sufficient. We do not need to immediately triage them to CT. And so if you don't use PCARN or if your, your emergency room is unfamiliar with this, I highly recommend working as a physicist with your radiologist and your radiologist with, your, with their colleagues uh, generally to look at different ways to triage when is the most appropriate time to use imaging, especially in the head for pediatrics. The next thing I've mentioned, I mentioned is, it, previously I mentioned that clinical indication is really high on the list when it comes to optimization. And so when we look at imaging for the head, understanding as an example, if we're, you, if we're imaging a high contrast task, such as imaging for hydrocephalus, shunt drain position, endoleak, et cetera, then you do not need the same level of radiation dose as you would be if you're looking for, uh, looking at the brain, the gray white matter differentiation or looking at some more subtle findings. And ways to kind of a approach this is to use different slice thicknesses. And so if you're using, if you're say imaging, for example, perfusion, we've already talked about this earlier, you don't need really thick, excuse me, thin images. You can use thicker images to maintain, keep the noise down and the dose down so that the perfusion algorithms can do what they need to. Generally speaking for pediatrics, five millimeters is still a good slice thickness. It's, the, it's really good. It's been shown to give good gray white differentiation. And you may think, well, even for little kids, that might feel like a lot, you know, five millimeters may feel like a lot, but the reality is that still gives really good gray white differentiation, especially because when you get younger, kids' brains actually have very little differentiation, There's little fat, you know, uh, more water-based parenchyma. And so we need to maintain that as best we can with a little bit thicker of a slice. Anything, if you're looking for fractures though, you do need to make sure you have a smaller or a thinner slice. So understand the clinical indication. Now, I mentioned age is a poor, prog a, a poor corollary for abdomen or the body, but in the head, it's actually a very strong corollary. Our heads grow logarithmically. 
And you can see basically in the first five to six years of our of a child's life, their head grows significantly. Just it's super, lots of change, super fast growth. And thereafter, it largely becomes just incremental changes over the rest of their growing, uh, over the lifespan, their growing lifespan, excuse me. The same can be said about the density of the calvarium. Here you can see, I just went in and I measured it for a handful of patients and you can see it's got a largely logarithmic approach too. And for that reason, most patients over five or six years old still need to be imaged at 120 kV. And that's just, you need that extra, you need that extra energy to penetrate through the, the skull, of course. But under five years old, you really should be trying to image with lower kV. And you do this so that you can get better gray-white uh, gray white tissue uh, contrast. Uh, as I mentioned previously, infant brains tend to have more of a watery consistency. All right, so can you use tube current modulation in image when imaging the head? The answer is yes. Uh, this publication down here looked at it and they found that generally speaking, CTI vol was reduced by between eight and 25% as compared to using fixed techniques. Um, there is talk about using auto KV selection. This is where the system, the compute, uh, the scanner will tell, will pick the right K the KV to be used in that acquisition. This, they demonstrate in this publication that you still can get about 15 to 20% reduction turning on auto KV selection and turning on, of course, tube current modulation. I, I, I have no reason to disagree with that other than the fact that as most kids, as most pediatrics are over six years old, you know, they're going to largely be falling in that bucket of 120 kV anyway. And so I don't know how much of a dose reduction you'll see in that uh, using auto KV selection, that is. So that said, on this right-hand side in this blue box, I'm just going to give you an example of how we image our heads. This, these are not, you know, this is not the way you should do it. This is a good starting point. This is a good reference. Uh, if you find your doses are lower than this and your radi neuroradiologists are happy, um, you know, kudos to you. If your doses are significantly higher than this, then maybe I would suggest taking a look at what you could do in collaboration with your neuroradiologist. But the dosing and the techniques I demonstrate here are what we have kind of honed in on over the last decade or so, and our neuroradiologists are happy with them. So caveats aside, for our under five-year-olds, we image everything at 100 kV. Uh, with about a 400 MA acquisition, and that gives us about 25 milligray CTDI. And then everything else, as I mentioned, is 120 kV. And depending on the size of the patient, if they're a teenage, toddler, teenager, or an adult, we have different MA outputs. So there was discussion about dual energy. And dual energy is not actually used that much in pediatrics. It has its niche uh, um, it has its areas where it's being used. And one of those areas in this publication, you can see in the head specifically, more and more people are using dual energy for pediatrics to reduce the beam hardening artifacts. So I, nothing to take away with the discussion about using dual energy to reduce metal artifacts. I think that's a different thing. I actually agree with the statement made that, that uh, the single energy metal artifact reduction softwares, all vendors have them, are actually really robust. But here we found that dual energy actually does a pretty good job at reducing the beam hardening and the streaking artifacts. Now, this is a benefit because for a long time, dual energy was not dose neutral. There was a slight dose penalty. But for most vendors nowadays, the single energy versus the dual energy, they're basically equivalent in dose. But dual energy, of course, gives us a little bit better artifact reduction, gives us the ability to do VNC, so virtual non-contrast. So you can do a contrast and a non-contrast image in one instead of doing two acquisitions. And you get the benefit of doing other things such as bone removal, which has been shown in various different publications to give a little bit better visualization of the, uh, the brain parenchyma and the vasculature in the brain. All right, so moving on, of course, we need to mi minimize motion. And there's a lot of different ways to do this for kids, feeding and swaddling, using blankets, Velcro restraints, et cetera. My caveat to that is whatever restraint device you use, absolutely make sure you image it first without a patient. Make sure there's no artifacting in it. Uh, if they're artifact free, then they're wonderful. Uh, there are different ways to calm them. You can usually have a patient standing next to them 
and with their arm or hand on a part of the body that's not being scanned. So if in the case of the head, you can, they can touch like their, their feet or something. Uh, for older patients, uh, depending on how and where you're imaging, if you're doing in the body, you can do goggles or uh, other things like that for music or sound or, or videos. In CT, we don't really use a lot of video just because it's so quick, but there are re reasons to do that, usually for developmentally delayed patients, et cetera. But research your different ways to keep the patients calm. That's a really good way to reduce the motion. The next way, of course, is relying on technology. Scan fast, fast tube rotation, fast table motion, wide volumetric imaging, if you have a system that can do that. At our institution, our two major, uh, two major vendors at our, in, at our hospital both have 16 centimeter coverage options. So I went through and I measured, I went through and I measured the kind of the distance from the apex of the skull down to the SOM line. And I was looking to see how many of our patients across the various different ages would fit within a single 16 centimeter rotation. And for the most part, I found that almost all of them would. And so the idea of using single rotation, a uh, wide cone beam imaging is actually, it leads to the fastest imaging possible. No matter how fast your table moves with your your, high, your turbo helical and all those other, you can't go faster than a single spin of 0 0.2, 0 0.25 mill, uh, seconds. So can you use helical imaging for the brain? Yes. I think the majority of people do use helical imaging for the brain. Now, a caveat to that is, and I know we actually, there was discussion about this earlier, about can should we use high pitch imaging for everything so we can just image quick? And the answer is, a little bit more nuanced in my opinion, because if you use high pitch, you're going to have a lot of helical overranging. Now, most vendors have ways to minimize this out, this overexposure, but you can't reduce it to zero. You have to have helical overranging for helical reconstruction. And the faster you go, the higher the pitch, the larger that helical overranging. So more and more of the non-image tissue is being exposed. So tissue that won't show up anywhere on packs is still being exposed to radiation. In this case, actually using lower pitch is very important because it minimizes your helical overranging. And two, especially imaging in the head, as I've worked with various different vendors and their engineers, what I'm about to say is kind of nuanced, but it's actually important to understand that there, there's a reason why a lot of them recommend using pitches less than one for brain imaging. So pitches say in the 0.5 to 0.8 range. And that's because when the reconstruction algorithm when you acquire at a low pitch, you're actually getting four samples per pixel. And this enables a more smoother weighting function in the reconstruction algorithm. Pitches of greater than one only have one sample per pixel. And a lot of that's just because of the averaging and the filling in because you're spiraling, you're not imaging every pixel. You have to average across it. Anything in between say pitches of one, uh, you're gonna have some kind of sampling between one and four. And because of that, the, the weighting function tends to be less smooth. And when we initially bought a system, we were imaging with pitches of one, we found that just our neuroradiologist did not like the look of it. I, I give you one example here. It kind of gave a little bit more of a crisper, more of a swirly look to the image. And that had everything to do with the pitch. The minute we went back down to a pitch of say 0.5 or 0.8, that went away, that look went away. So. It's nuanced. I recommend still with helical imaging for the head to use lower pitches, less than one, I should say. Now, when we're imaging in the eye, imaging in the head, the eye lens is one of the more radiosensitive organs or tissues that we're trying to not expose. The reality is you just can't read, you can't not image the eye lens. You can tilt the head, you can tilt the gantry, if you're using helical, the helical overranging is going to expose it. Even if you're using a single spin, there's still going to be some kind of gradient of dose into the eye. And because of that, using the newer technology, well, not really new now, but using the organ-based dose modulation technology on most vendors is a great way to reduce the anterior exposure to these more sensitive organs. So in a publication that I was, a, I, I, I participated in many years ago, we found that the dose is reduced by about 25 to 30% to these anterior structures when you use this organ-based dose modulation. And when we get down to the body, we'll talk a little bit about it too, but generally this can also be used uh, for reducing dose, say to the thyroid, the breast tissue, anything anterior to the body.
So the question you would probably ask me is, okay, well, if I'm reducing MA anteriorly, am I increasing the noise or am I decreasing the diagnostic quality of the image anterior? And the answer is no. And we, I've looked at this several ways. I'm not going to go through all the details of it, but you can see here the standard deviations on this image on the right, TCM plus organ dose modulation is a little higher than just tube current modulation. So yes. But overall, as I've talked to radi neuroradiologists after neuroradiologists, they do not, they've never said that this is detrimental to their diagnostic task. So I guess unless you're absolutely imaging for the orbit, there really is no reason to not use this ODM. So it, there's very slight decreases in image quality, very, very slight increases in noise. So you can also change the reconstruction approach if you're imaging for the head. Majority of neuroradiologists, however, like FBP. Let's be honest, they like filter back projection. It has the F in FBP does a great job of removing image blur and sharpening the image. And so uh, I think a lot of our neuroradiologists have just come become very comfortable with that look over the years. And it's just really hard to get good tissue contrast differentiation in the brain. And so when you subtly change things, you can affect the way they perceive the image. And we know that iterative reconstruction, and we'll talk a little bit later about deep learning reconstruction, they still do subtly change the way the image looks. That said, if your neuroradiologists are comfortable with it, in a, in a work we did several years ago, we found that you can still get meaningful dose reduction using iterative reconstruction. But once again, understanding that it will subtly, it takes the noise away, but it will subtly change the way the image looks. So you have to work with your neuroradiologist in that regard. Moving forward, the other 25 big chunk of imaging, 25% of all imaging done in pediatrics is in the abdomen pelvis. So in a similar fashion, I'd like to go through some pointers on how to reduce dose or to optimize, excuse me, imaging for the body. So once again, starting at the top of that list, only image when necessary. And one of the tools that we can use for this is ACR's appropriateness criteria. These are a great tool. It, they break down, they give you lots of different examples of clinical indications, and then they break down the various different imaging modality options and when it would probably be appropriate, usually appropriate, maybe appropriate, and usually not appropriate. And it gives you a rough dose estimate or a dose level estimate of those modalities. So in this example, for example, in this example here, CT would probably usually be appropriate and the type of CT it's talking about here would have a certain dose limit. And then it, in, in, and this gives a kind of a classic example of why we don't shove every pediatric patient into an MR or an ultrasound, because in this one example, they actually fall a little bit lower on, on, this, cri on this criteria list. So it's important to know this, but it's more important because I think most radiologists know this, but it's more important to work with the radiologists and your ordering physicians. So when they go into their, into their, into their medical, um, the hospital systems, you know, their epics or whatever they're using, and they go to order imaging, this is built into those metrics so that the system goes in. If it's a pen suspected appendicitis, it will give a list of options, uh, hierarchy options for imaging. So working with important like PACS people and IT people to get this into those the workflows is very important. All right. So, excuse me, scanning only appropriate, scanning only the areas that are being clinically indicated. So we need to be work with our technologists. What we need to make sure they're, they're setting the start and end regions properly, that they're not being sloppy. Uh, AI software is coming a long way. A lot of the newer systems will actually auto recognize. So if you're doing a chest, a routine chest, it's going to auto recognize where to start the, the top, maybe up at the clavicles and end down at the dome or a little bit beyond the dome of the liver. And so this is a great way to be a little bit more consistent. Uh, but another great way and tool for us is using our dose monitoring softwares and looking at DLP. DLP, of course, is the most sensitive metric that will be affected by changes in the start and stop location. So if we find that a particular protocol or a particular technologist has relatively high DLPs, well, we can go in and we can work with them and to fix the issue. Uh, we've already talked quite a bit this, so I won't really belabor the point, but multiphasic imaging is rarely indicated in pediatrics. There are cases where we need it. I'm not saying it's never used, but it's rare. In this publication, back in 2018, they went through and they, they basically laid out the, the argument, as Dr. Smith-Beinman already talked about yesterday, 
of why we really don't need to use multiphasic imaging in children. So that said, as of 2018, only about 12% of imaging occurrences, at least in this in the hospital in this publication, were imaged with two more than one phase, so two phases or more. Now that said, when they looked at it, they found that 53% of all the referrals imaging that came into their pediatric hospital came with more than one phase, two or more phases. So this goes back to that example of majority of imaging is happening outside of pediatric hospitals. We need to work with our colleagues everywhere to help understand that another best way to reduce dose in pediatrics is only image what is necessary. So what about imaging fast? So yes, in the body, I highly recommend going fast as you can. Pitches of greater than one is going to have a little bit of a, a helical overranging effect, but now we're trying to image through non-voluntary motion. You know, we got, we can usually hold our breath, but not every kid can hold their breath. And then of course you got cardiac imaging. So the faster you go, the better we are at reducing these non-volume, uh, non, uh, to reducing these types of motion artifacts and also gross motion. So if you have a non-compliant patient, that's going to be moving a little bit here and there. Our new, the latest newest systems can actually go pretty darn fast to actually freeze even bulk motion from non-compliant patients. Uh, I once again give that caveat that this is large kind of coverage. So thorax, ab and pelvis, or chest and pelvis, that's great. But if you're still doing a limited exam, say you're just doing the kidneys, I highly recommend you keep the pitch less than one so that you minimize the overranging, helical overranging. All right. Uh, there was discussion about when, how low we can go with KV. I love that most of the newer systems have these really high, uh, high capacity, high performance generators and tubes. Most of these systems can go up to 1.2, so 1200 amps uh, across all KV stations. That is phenomenal because that means we can do most of our imaging at the low end. So I'm giving you an example. This is a patient, two patients, both 17 year olds, both have a lateral effect, uh, excuse me, lateral dimension of 30 centimeters. One was imaged with 30, excuse me, 80 kV, and the other one is imaged with 120 kV. They both have the same CTDI, so relative output is basically the same. Image quality, obviously, is what changed. Tissue contrast is so much better in the 80 kV versus the one on the right. And I just point this out that the windowing leveling was the same in both of these images. So giving an example, just give an example of where we've been, historically, we've almost always imaged at 100 to 120 kV. And this is has led to a median historical dose of about 4.4 milligram. Now I know that doesn't mean a lot because it's exponential, but just for a way to compare, historically, this is where we've been. And some of our more recent CT purchases, we have been able to, oh, I'm sorry, that's a typo. Our recent exams are now at 80 kV. The majority of our imaging is now performed at 80 kV. And so now our median output is two milligram. So we've basically lowered our dose to our population by about 55% by simply changing the KV. So these really powerful systems allow us to image lower and lower, 70, 80, and 90 KV. So here I'm going to give you an example of how we image. Once again, this is just simply a reference. This isn't the golden standard. But we do image at 70 KV for our youngest neonate type patients. And then for, as I mentioned, the majority of our patients between 16 to 80 kilos. So this is really toddlers to kind of large teenagers. We are comfortably able to image all of these patients. Now we, I've set my tube current modulation to allow it to go to its max. And this allows me to image these bigger patients, but at 80 KV, the dosing is, as I showed in the previous slide, still about 40, 50% lower than it was at the 120 KV stations. As a caveat, uh, kind of an aside, when we turned these systems on a couple of years ago, our a very astute radiologist immediately called me and thought we were frying our kids because they saw the MA in the corner of their pack screen and it all said, you know, 1,000, 1,200 MA. And of course they were freaking out. And I love that they did. I then pointed them to the KV side of their screen and said, this is at 80 instead of 120. And so doing this shift will require a little bit of education to help them understand that high MA, low KV actually still means dose reduction. And then for all the rest of our patients, we image at 100 KV. We actually, and this, and most of our examples, excuse me, in most of our patients now, we don't even need 120 anymore. And that's including the adult size patients we image. Now I give you 
I told you about the upper limit. A lot of the systems that we purchase that come with their built-in pediatric protocols all have minimum settings that are too low. And this is an example of one-year-old patient imaged. They're both imaged at 70 kV, but the one on the right had a minimum MA of 110. And the one on the left, uh, actually the setting was a little bit higher than that. I can't remember what it was. But you can see just on the image on the right, because it hit its minimum MA of 110, it was just non-diagnostic. We And the CTDI was 0.3. I mean, 0.3 is just nothing. Yeah, everyone would like a 0.3 versus a 1.3. But the difference between and that one centigrade, that one CTDI, excuse me, one centigrade CTDI, the difference was it was between diagnostic and non-diagnostic. And when we, we're never going to quibble, uh, quibble over one milligray. It's just not, I said centigrade. I'm so sorry. One milligray. We should never quibble over one milligray. All right. So going on to the algorithm, uh, to the reconstruction algorithm side. So historically we've been using filter back rejection for a very long time. And then over the last decade, iterative reconstruction came in in all of its glory and all of its variations using statistical based, using model based. And then we kind of all settled in on hybrids of the two. But in the last five years, we've seen a change towards um, deep learning reconstruction. And three of the four main vendors out there have algorithms you can, uh, reconstruction algorithms you can purchase to run natively on their system. There are a couple of systems like companies like Algometica and ClariPy. They allow you to buy their system and they can do use deep learning reconstruction independent of what type of vendor or manufacturer you have. So Deep learning has offered us an enhancement in where we were with statistical, or with, excuse me, just iterative reconstruction. Iterative reconstruction demonstrated over the last decade that we could reduce the noise easily, uh, not easily, but effectively. And that's great. But the biggest downfall to iterative reconstruction was that it changed the way the image looked. It softened it. The, con the texture was different. Ultimately, our radiologist had to kind of settle in on using a lower level of iterative reconstruction based on the way it m manipulated the image. Deep learning reconstruction, I demonstrate here in the right-hand corner, it does not have what's called a regularization function. Iterative reconstruction is looking for uniform areas in the body, and it applies a... a, a uh, a smoothing kernel to just kind of smooth out that noise. And the problem with that is it has a tendency to smooth out or reduce the edge edges of our, of our, of the organs in the image. So I give you an example here. What I've done is on the left side, I took a filter back projected image and I reconstructed it using statistical based iterative reconstruction and I subtracted the two. And that's what you see here. What you see here is all the detail that was removed from the, FBP image. And then on the right is the same thing, but I subtracted FBP from deep learning. And this is all the information that was removed. So a couple of things you notice. Uh, first of all, generally speaking, a lot of the noise was removed in both of those image images. But on the left image, you can actually see the outlines of most of the organs. You can see where the liver and the kidneys were. You can definitely see where the vertebral body and the ribs and some of the uh, the colon and or a stomach. And because of that, that means that these edges were removed from the iterative reconstruction. And that's why they appear a little softer. But on the deep learning side, generally speaking, you can't see the outlines of the organs, which means the structures, the boundaries of the structures largely stay intact as compared to the, the way we used to image them with FBP. And that's why the sharpness of FBP is still in the deep learning reconstructed images. And I would actually argue that the amount of noise removed in the deep learning is, is more than what we were removing in iterative reconstruction. Here's just an example of lung, so thorax. You can see on the left, more a lot of noise removed versus the image uh, on the right, which was iterative reconstruction. And for fairness, I compared those two where I subtracted once again, FPP from iterative reconstruction on the left and FPP subtracted from deep learning. And you can see on the iterative reconstruction side, a lot of the detail in the lungs, you know, the vasculature, the lung parenchyma, all that actually got removed from the iterative reconstructed images. On the right, that was not removed from deep learning. And so that detail remains. Another question you may ask is, can we use deep well, learning? Dr. For... Brady, sorry, yes. I'm going to interrupt you just a second for a quick time check. Um, you've got about four minutes to wrap up. Perfect. 
That's about what I need. So you could, you, the next question you could ask about is deep learning reconstruction. Uh, or, or using deep learning reconstruction, can we use that for dose reduction? In this case, what I did is I imaged from about 300 MAS down to 10 MAS. And I looked at two things. The first I looked at is how does the noise change going down a dose? And we found that the deep learning reconstructed algorithms could really reduce the noise pretty well. I, I reduced the noise in those images. And then the next thing we, I asked was, can you change the tech? How does the texture change? And what we found is all the way down to about 83% dose reduction, the noise texture stayed the same uh, within 10% of the, of the original dose uh, or the higher dose at 300 MAS. And so this is what it looks like as an example. The two vendors, we love them both. I'm not trying to say one is better than the other, but you can see that the one on the left has a little bit less noise in it with a slightly different texture change. The one on the right has a little bit more noise with a little bit more consistent texture change from the higher dose level. So can we use deep learning to reduce dose? There are several publications that have done prospective studies and they have basically looked at the diagnostic accuracy and they found that you can get really robust dose reduction and maintain diagnostic accuracy. And this depended on, um, on looking at abdominal lesions, pulmonary nodules, et cetera. Uh, whereas iterative reconstruction only really allowed for dose reductions down up to about 30%. And after that, we lost a lot of the, the low contrast diagnostic tasks. So in conclusion, the first lesson we need to learn is is what the, we need to learn what the radiologist needs out of the image and work with them and understanding that dose is not always, changing the dose isn't always the right answer. And then the next thing we, I talked about is you need to know your CT technology. And then the best way to minimize CT dose is only image when it's necessary and to set up those algorithms in your ED department and with your ordering physicians to help them understand when it is appropriate to image uh, to order ionizing based imaging such as CT. A couple of really quick things I'm really excited about for technology that's coming down the road for pediatrics, future innovations, faster scanners. They're on the horizon of going down to about 0.2 seconds. So that means faster imaging, less motion. 1024 by 1024 reconstruction. We've lived in a 512 by 512 reconstruction matrix world, but having this higher resolution gives us better in-plane resolution, especially for our really little patients in small anatomy. Photon counting. I'm actually really excited about this and not necessarily for the lower noise and lower dose, but because it will enhance the spatial resolution in the imaging. And AI post-processing. We have to do a lot of alignment and auto alignment because kids don't always come properly centered when we place them on the table. And AI will help reduce that time the technologists need when they, you know, when they have to go and post-process all the imaging before the next patient comes on into the room. So thank you. I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties at, at the beginning and would be glad to help answer questions if either live or in the chat.